you ever contemplated what classical art painted by an artificial intelligence might look like? In this episode, I talk with Richard Allen Herbert, who was inspired by Alec Radford's work in deep convolutional generative adversarial networks. You can also think of this as a deep convolutional GAN. In Alec's work, they focused on generative images of bedrooms, faces, and album art. The work is truly inspiring, and Richard takes us through his own journey and advances with his own model built around classical artwork. Let's hop in the show. Hey everyone, I'm here with Richard, who put a blog post up called Generating Fine Art with 300 Lines of Code. Uh, I read the blog post. I had to learn more. Richard, thanks for getting a cup of coffee with me. How are you doing? Doing well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I would love to know what inspired you. I know you talked a little bit about Alec Radford's work. Tell me about that moment when you read that blog post and their research. What happened next? Yeah, well, I actually think it was, uh, and I'm going to butcher his name, but Sumith Shantala's, uh, his uh, implementation of the deconvolutional generative adversarial network in Torch. So I read up, I uh, just happened upon that page. And then also Alec Radford's post and the actual paper that they wrote together, I believe. Um, and, you know, you go there and the, the, the first thing it says is that all the images on this website are uh, generated by an algorithm or generated by the model. And what you see are totally convincing looking bedrooms, anime faces, uh, album covers, and it's just kind of mind blowing. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's it, anyone who's interested in, I think, machine learning uh, and any kind of uh, generative uh, work, generative models, is going to be pretty excited when they see stuff that looks like it could have been taken by a camera or could have been drawn by a human artist. Yeah, let me actually. I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen and pull it up here. Um, Great. Yeah. Are you able to see my screen? Uh huh. Yeah. So I, this is I, this is the work that you're talking about, right? Exactly. Yeah, and it's it's it is fascinating. So I mean, uh, I was taking a look at this before we hopped on, and um, they talked a little bit about the kind of the, the progression that this stuff. And when I mm -hmm. actually originally saw your work, I was like, oh, okay. There's some cool photos uh, of some bedrooms and some paintings, <laughs> and yeah. So, so how how do you kind of see this work? Like, what are we what are we looking at from your eyes? Well, I mean, uh, if I didn't know better, if I was just glancing at this, uh, I wouldn't think twice. It would look like you know some uh, you know some photos pulled from real estate websites or something like that. Um, this uh, this one in the linear space is, I think, the part that blew my mind the most um, because it's uh, it's it's effectively walking through you know just a distribution, a statistical distribution is just walking through uh, a probability space. And it's generating yeah. what is a consistent, uh, it, it's, you're getting a peek inside what is actually this real space. And it, it is linear, it's consistent through time. I mean, you can see windows appear and disappear in a way that makes sense spatially and t almost temporally. Um, so yeah, I mean, w just from a uh, person who never seen something like this before, who is just getting into this, uh, this to me is like the future, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, in terms of generative, uh, unsupervised learning, which is some of the most exciting stuff in machine learning at the moment. So, when you read this, I'm I guess I think this was like a month or two ago, right? It wasn't it wasn't that all that long ago, um, or how long ago was it? I I don't know for sure, but yeah, it was, it's a matter of months, uh, okay. less than half a year. And so, what do you do? Like, are you a programmer by trade? Like, what like what's your kind of hobby or or your career? Yeah, so I am trying to be a programmer by trade. Um, I'm a student right now. I started programming a little less than two years ago. I uh, kind of made a, a shift from trying to be a filmmaker into a whole different career path after I realized that that wasn't going to work out. So I started into programming, mostly just in web development. But even before I'd started programming, I had been interested in artificial intelligence and machine learning and had just been too uh, daunted and scared of all the prerequisites and uh, just, you know, you think you can't get into it because uh, you're not smart enough. <laughs> and slowly over time, I learned, you know, a little bit about neural networks. I went from a simple perceptron to simple stochastic gradient descent. Uh, and then I started playing around with, you know, recurrent networks. And then just in passing, I uh, had a friend who wanted just to some quick recaps and models with convolutional neural networks. And, you know, you go down that wormhole and eventually end up in, in this type of stuff. <laughs> That's awesome. It's um, it's really interesting because because my audience, uh, it, at least the intention is for, for programmers, and I, and I work at a startup, and and we lead a, a small engineering team, and so I think that that feeling that you're talking about of going from seeing some of this cool work into actually working on it, I think it I think is a little bit more easy to kind of get in than people think, especially people with technical competence. Is that kind of that's been your journey a little bit? 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, when you think of how hard this must have been 20 years ago, um, and how easy the open source libraries like Torch and TensorFlow, uh, Theano, the wrappers like Keras, Cafe, I mean, there, it, there's so many that you have to stop naming them, right? Um, and you need to understand the concepts to be able to get into them too deeply if you want to debug and if you want to build new models. But you don't have to do diff, you know, you don't have to do long uh, derivatives by hand anymore just to get things to run. You don't have to actually come come up with LSTMs from scratch or recurrent neural networks from scratch or code road convolutional math. And I think that means that if you can, if you have a little bit of patience, a little bit of determination, and are willing to kind of grasp some of the global concepts then you can be doing some pretty advanced stuff just on your home computer and, and not that much time. Yeah. So take us back. So you saw you saw the work uh, online and you said, OK, I'm, I'm going to try this out. Is that kind of the yeah. next step? You talk yeah. to a friend? Like, what, what happens next when you see the work? Uh, I mean, I, I talk to, I sort of talk at people that I know about this stuff, but no one that I know actually knows anything about this stuff. So I just kind of talk to them as if they knew, and then they say, oh, Thanks, and then you know it doesn't go anywhere other than that. But yeah, I mean something like that, you just get really excited about. So I spent some time trying to figure out what I wanted to do, um, and I knew I wanted to do something else other than the examples that had been seen. Um, so Terry, Terence Broad, I believe, uh, kind of made a little bit of a uh, uh, a wave when he posted uh, auto encoding Blade Runner on Medium, and he used a TensorFlow implementation of DCGAN and added a variational auto encoder on top. And I was really interested in variational autoencoders as well. You know, anything that was generative, I was pretty interested in. And I knew that there were some people who had combined these two models. So that's what I knew I wanted to do, is I wanted to figure out how to do that. Do it in Torch, because I had just started out in that. I really liked the language. I really liked the iTorch interactive uh, coding environment. So that's kind of where I went. Um, I started just by trying Blade Runner, um, and you know, which is kind of cool. And I got some very, very small uh, pictures that looked interesting. Um, and then adding the variational autoencoder on top ended up being the most challenging part because there weren't a whole lot of torch implementations of that. And going from uh, kind of a linear variational autoencoder to a convolutional one proved to be a, a good, you know, exorcism by fire into yeah, interesting <laughs> into this stuff. You you say so you kind of mentioned this uh, variational autoencoder. Like, what was the inception to want to, when you saw their work and then thought, oh, aha, I want to do this? Like, how did you know that you wanted to merge those two concepts together? Was were you inspired, or, or what was what was that? Like, did you have a strategy, or I'm I'm pretty sure that I read a Torch blog post, a blog post on the actual Torch website that had uh, generated faces, and they had mentioned uh, adding a variational autoencoder on top. And so I think, and I had read about variational autoencoders. I thought they were fascinating. Um, and so, uh, can you actually you know, can you take a moment to explain what that means, at least the way that you understand it? Yeah, I can try. I'm not a I am a math major, but I'm not that far yet, so I'll Fair do my enough. best. Uh, but effectively, what a variational autoencoder does is it allows you to uh, take. Uh, it kind of works like a regular autoencoder. So an autoencoder can be linear, it can be convolutional, it can even be recurrent. What it does is it takes an input of some kind, it reduces it down to a, a smaller compressed state. And then it re-encodes it back to the original state. So it, it can do anything. That's kind of why it's called an autoencoder. It's not specific to any type of data or file format. It just has to be a matrix or a vector or you know, any, any kind of numbers. Right. What a variational autoencoder does is allows you to kind of take the hidden state and generate samples from it. If you try and generate samples from a regular hidden state, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult. And the previous solutions have been something like, uh, you know, Markov chain Monte Carlo, some very, very difficult integral stuff. Um, what variational autoencoders allow you to do is basically to turn that hidden state and by gradient descent, uh, make it fit into a distribution of your choice, which is typically the Gaussian, the isotropic Gaussian distribution. So that means that if you want to sample from the latent space, all you have to do is pass a, a vector or matrix of uh, Uniform samples, uh, so you know, so a, a range of numbers that have been sampled from the uniform Gaussian distribution. You can pass that through the decoder, um, and you can you can essentially get glimpses of the latent space, which is uh, what the generative part is. Yeah. So you're basically, able to to get samples from the hidden state. And then is that part of the piece that is kind of? And uh, actually, I'll, I'll hop back to sharing my screen. Sure. Um, although I'm just jumping ahead a little bit, I suppose. But <laughs> kind of getting into that piece of of actually generating these unique images is that kind of that that piece of it where you're pulling out the hidden part of it? Yeah. So there's basically to to this model, 
there are three components, right? There's the variational autoencoder and the generative adversarial network. So these two models actually share kind of a middle space. So the generative part of the generative adversarial network and the decoder of the variational autocoder are actually the same uh, model. They're the same layer. So they share latent space. So um, you have a, an encoder that takes the original image, um, it decodes it into a hidden space, and then re-encodes it, and you do backprop on the, on, on the whole model. Then you do another pass where you do the generative adversarial part, and that, then you use the, the decoder of that as the generator, and then you use another third model, the discriminator, Wow. And you back prop on those two things. So it's, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to describe, but if you think of a Venn diagram, right, and you have the variational autoencoder on the left and a GAN on the right, the place where they intersect is the generator decoder. So, they are, so there are two separate models, but they're sharing latent space so that the variational autoencoder is forcing the, gen the generative part, the generator, to be good at its job to begin with, to generate samples that already start to look like they're from whatever data set you're training on. And that that's, I have found helps stabilize the model. So yeah, so the two things are fighting against each other, and then you're really looking at the output in the middle, which is is kind of these these net results of these images that we're looking at that are generative. Yeah, exactly. And if you think about it, actually, all three models are fighting against each other because the variational autoencoder wants to code the original images. It doesn't want to encode random images. The generator wants to code random images, and right. the discriminator wants to to guess which is which. So all three models. Kind of form this like you know kind of nonlinear stable yeah. system. So, pulling up your um, your blog post again, kind of hopping around, um, we're looking at the generation uh, mosaic uh, of of some art. And so, you went into art was kind of the next piece of saying, what if I apply this to art? Is that kind of what we're looking at here? Yeah, it was. Uh, I knew I wanted to do something interesting with it. I wanted to do something that hadn't been done before. Um, so Kaggle has a, a bunch of competitions and a bunch of data sets. Kaggle is the machine learning kind of competition and uh, open source data sets and learning site. Uh, it's this big hub for machine learning. Companies will put on problems that need to be solved for cash sums. Some they have just kind of toy competitions. You can go and uh, see if you know how good you can do. And they had a a data set uh, that was just a bunch of paintings uh, from Wikimedia Commons. Cool. So it seemed like a really good uh, good try. You know, originally I wanted to do movies, but movies are hard because you have to get a lot, a lot of, of samples from different places, and, um, and they're always a little bit blurry. It's hard to crop them right if you want to do a square, which is a little bit easier. So yeah, so the paintings just seem like a natural fit. So when you say movies, do you mean movie stills? Do you mean movie scenes, movie posters? Yeah, movie stills was what I originally wanted Got to it. do. Yeah. Okay. And so the idea in this situation, it might be we might see a like a, a still that maybe has a, a Godfather feeling to it. Another <laughs> one that might have a Scarface feel, that kind of thing. Yeah, right. So something like that. Um, I think you'd end up something with more like along genre lines and any sure. specific movie. Yeah. Um, and that's the challenge, of course, with any of these uh, is that you do need a rather large data set, and it needs to be pretty diverse. So mm -hmm. as you can see, looking at this generation mosaic, uh, there are distinct styles, right? Mm -hmm. you can, you know, one looks modern, one looks like a portrait, some have frames, some have the circles, you know, it learns yeah. to actually, it learns to actually uh, frame them within a circle. Um, they're landscapes, they're clearly ones that are portraits. Um, and this is only possible because there are 70,000 unique paintings. Uh, uh, so, the, you know, that's that's a unique data set that, that definitely is just yeah. screaming to be used in this type of model. So when you first started playing around with the model and the data, how, like what, what what I'm looking at here, how fully baked is this? Meaning, is this like the <laughs> tenth iteration of you playing with a ton of different parameters? Is this like kind of close to the first pass? Um, no, I wouldn't say it's anywhere near close to the first pass because okay. I went through a few different variations of the variational autoencoder. Um, many so first, um, so there there aren't that many examples of the variational autoencoder in Torch. There there are a few more in TensorFlow, but none of them are beginner friendly. And at this point, I was still pretty beginner. I still am, but because of this stuff, I feel a little bit less so. But that was you know first when I was still learning about all this stuff. So yeah, so actually to do the variational autoencoder in Torch. Um, I ended up kind of uh, using a, using another model and kind of fitting it on top, but it took a long time to figure out how to make that that work. So I would say what you see there is probably the hundredth or so iteration, just because the heuristics of the variational autoencoder tend to be relatively difficult. Yeah, that's interesting.
Uh, how much time does something like that take? To train or to, to model not, in the first place? Yeah, so I mean like the actual, yeah, not the training part of it, the more of you kind of sitting down and, and kind of modeling it from your perspective. Yeah, well, for someone like me who um, is still a beginner in all of this, it, it took a long time. Um, but the nice thing is that it trained me on everything I needed to know. I mean, you have to do data pre-processing. You have to work with lots of different types of uh, layers. You have, you know, like the... Um, you have to you have to learn a lot about the actual heuristics and you know machine learning it seems to me is so much about heuristics um, in a way that formal stats is not maybe yeah and so yeah I mean it for me it took you know probably three months of, of hard work and trying different things I imagine someone who just wanted who knew about those models who was experienced and knew how to put them together it would have taken a lot less time makes sense and the the master of 10,000 hours concept a little bit of yeah that. something exactly um, so I think we we kind of touched on this, and I and I kind of showed this a little sooner than maybe I liked. But we were <laughs> I was looking at the at some of the work that your work is based on, and this is you mentioned the windows yeah. uh, kind of appearing and disappearing, and I think it's fascinating if if the viewers look at these images. If you notice, first and foremost, these are all generative, and if you look all the way to the left, I believe that is the non-window state, and then as you go right, it introduces a window state, uh, and it's fascinating to look at some of these examples of, of that transition. It's crazy. Yeah, it's straight up mind-blowing because uh, every image, um, for the most part, every single image to the left or right looks like a, a legitimate continuation of the last. But looking from the first to the last image, uh, they look like sometimes they're in totally different bedrooms. Yeah. But the transformation is linear, which is, and it, it does make sense, which is crazy. <laughs> when, when you see this too, so obviously the images are small, um, and sure. I know that, that that's part of kind of by by the nature of needing to do this, right? They have a lot of pixels to manipulate, just makes the problem exponentially harder, but you're not actually kind of solving anything, quote unquote, because you're testing ideas the way that I would understand this. Correct. Um, you know, it, it is fascinating because I do think over time, I mean, you start to have probably really interesting images and really big images and highly detailed and be really even more interesting to see what are some of these aspects you know some of these things that looks like a bed and i'm assuming the model is kind of suggesting a bed but i'd love to really know what like what what is it what does it actually look like you know what i mean yeah right um yeah that's a good point and uh you know blowing these up to bigger sizes is a non-trivial task uh right. gans are just known for being incredibly uh uh What's we're fragile, essentially. You know, there's stability and they need stability, but that can be tricky. And there's there there have been you know white papers about all the different ways just to simply stabilize GANs, and and uh, it's hard to know exactly what uh, what kinds of data sets and what kind of distributions they can truly model. And these are active areas of research. Um, right. You know, for me, I was able to blow up my uh, my model to 128 by 128, but only after taking the variational autoencoder part off, which definitely stabilizes the model. And at least for the art, makes uh, the pictures look a lot more like they have content in them. You know, the mm -hmm. content is more identifiable when you have the variational autoencoder on top. But as you can imagine, um, you know, if you just think about all the different parameters and the size of the features and how limited we are in terms of video, uh, you know, in terms of GPU memory for most uh, uh, home, you know. Uh, home use is going to be hard to find a lot of mm. GPU memory, so you can imagine how there's just sort of a bottleneck to to how yeah. far you can really build these up. So I kind of have a kind of a philosophical question for you, which is, who do you feel like owns the rights to these paintings? Let's just say one of these paintings <laughs> was fantastic, and everyone wanted to pay you a million dollars for it. Who owns the right to that photo or that that painting? Yeah, that's a great question, um, and I think that it will not be long until a question like this comes to the courts because uh, people will start making art that is generated generated purely by computers. And uh, I don't know if it's going to be the, this type of thing or if it's going to be something else, but this will end up in court one day. I, I can pretty much yeah. guarantee it. Um, I would. I mean, right now, if you had one of these in front of me, like I would absolutely buy one and I'd hang it in my office. <laughs> and it's simply for the story to say a, a, a human didn't paint this, right? And so it already has an inherent value, which which boggles my mind. Yeah, and I think uh, you know, there's a. I mean, when someone, some people think of art and science as things that you create. Some of them think the things you discover. Um, you know, do you do you, when you draw a painting? Uh, is it you drawing it, or is it just the culmination of your experience and uh, and a learned model? And how is that any different from what's going on here? Um, maybe the owners are the people who supply the data. Right. Um, 
maybe it's the you know maybe it's the it's the accumulative copyright of all of these. Uh, although I imagine not many of these are actually copyrighted in the data set because of uh, their fine art right. and probably from the past. But let's say it wasn't. You know, would all of these images be owned by the uh, the entire breadth of people who contributed to the data set? I mean, I'm of the opinion that art is about discovery. Um, and that artists are constantly discovering their own work, but at the same time, uh, you know, a lot of people went into, you know, to get these images. People had to pre-process this data and put it in a data set for me, in, in at least two or three different times. So yeah, I mean, I, that's why I think it's uh, kind of everyone's. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because if you if you really break it down from a, like I think of a book right in, in the same process written to a creative you know fiction piece or something like that uh, I wonder you I think you can make an argument that certain people made up certain narratives and then certain people made up certain settings and there's certain language pieces and you start to get this really muddled and I think that's part of the reason that a copyright expires over time is at least the intention right. right it's like you're always building off of someone else's work but it is really interesting to kind of move that needle faster but uh it's an interesting conversation i totally agree with you that it will be settled in court sooner than later yeah. <laughs> or at least or at least started in court sooner than later well there's already i think been a ruling i actually don't remember what the ruling was but the selfie that the chimp took or is a, maybe an orangutan but um i think it was a chimp took a selfie of himself and it was yeah. a question of who owned that photo and that actually did go to court i don't remember what the ruling was but i thought the ruling was that it went to the photographer although it might have went to the monkey oh well okay you know what? I, I don't know, and and I feel bad speculating, but yeah. Yeah. Well, the fact that it went to court at all probably probably ends up going to the photographer, but the fact mm -hmm. that it went to court at all shows that there is no clear consensus mm -hmm. on that type of question. Let me take a moment to say that this wouldn't be possible without companies like Amazon.com. If you have experience with machine learning and are looking for a new challenge, they have over a hundred opportunities available. Be sure to check out the link in the description, and let's get back to the show. One of the other things I wanted to pull up from the the original piece that inspired you was something that they had talked about faces. You had uh -huh. talked about doing it with film and you talked about doing it with art. When you saw their work on faces, did this cross kind of your consideration set of, of working in this space at all? It did a little bit. Um, so what's interesting is there's a, uh, I mean, you look at these and uh, the, of course the problem is, is that the human mind is highly attuned to recognize faces and recognize something is off. So there's a lot of uncanny valley going on here. Um, and it's, it's the, 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 the bar for faces and for the human form is going to be massively higher than anything else in terms of convincing other humans because we are just, uh, you know, we are basically uh, programmed to know faces really well. Um, and one of the things that's interesting between the variational auto Coder adversarial network is that the variational autoencoder uh, prefers global features, and the generative adversarial network definitely prefers details. So as you can see in those photos, um, there's kind of a there is a lot of detail, but uh, a lot of it uh, sometimes makes the faces look weird. So some of them look pretty good. Some of them look like there's like you know a lot of kind of uh, you know like deformations. It almost looks like their their face is liquid and stuff. Right. If you look at the variational autoencoders when they do this, you get a much more blurry face, but it's far more convincing in terms of its features. The feature space is smoother, but uh, the form seems pretty good. So there is somewhat of a uh, trade-off between having a face that looks convincing but kind of blurry and a face that is highly detailed but definitely not as convincing in terms of like this is a real human face and not like you know kind of a, uh, a deformed photo. Yeah, and you talk about the the human mind's ability to spot these little things, and we, you know, they talk about symmetry in the face as being, some, right. you know, underlying part of beauty, and so our eye is highly attuned to to find that, and I, you do notice that when you're kind of perusing these images, where there's like a an eye floating, or you know, yeah. <laughs> kind of uh, squished, or you know, cross eyed effect. Um, uh, it's very quick to to notice, but. It is pretty interesting. Yeah, these are. Yeah, yeah, right. It's very, very interesting. And uh, but yeah, the with the faces, these are probably, you know, this is state of the art stuff. And if yeah. this was anything other than a human face, we probably wouldn't notice a difference. Um, right. And the only reason we do is just because yeah, we're 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 programmed to to know faces in and out. It is interesting to kind of test my my mind with my eye here, looking at the sunglass one um, because <laughs> it you know it's blocking the eyes, and so all of a sudden I think those images immediately jump out to me as being far more realistic, and I think it's because mm. I I can't judge 
a really component part, uh, which it would be the eyes in this situation. Yeah, so that makes total sense that, uh, yeah, the eyes are a big part of it. When, uh, when you can hide one aspect of it, it's going to change the whole global, global space in your mind. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, the rotating faces, I thought it was interesting. But the one thing I did want to get to, um, and you mentioned it briefly, was kind of the album covers. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it's really cool. So obviously we saw the, the, the kind of the bedroom stuff. We saw your work with the art. Uh, and it's interesting when I, you first glance at these, my mind, I can feel it trying to be like, oh, I recognize that album. Yeah. <laughs> like, Wait a second. No, this is nothing I've ever seen. But it's, it's crazy. It, it, it's sellable. It's, it's awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you could, if if uh, if these authors or anyone could blow these up to, you know, to printable sizes, uh, then you'd have a whole market on your hands. You know, uh, what's really really interesting about these is that if you look pretty closely, you know, I've been staring at uh, these and my own stuff. I mean, for for months. So, um, but it's what's interesting is that the the model definitely, even with totally different data sets. Uh, does seem to favor certain kinds of features. You know, if you look in the middle, there's kind of that almost purely purple one with just some, some kind of swirls in it. And you know, I've gone to the point where I can actually recognize that if I didn't know, I would know this was a, a generative adversarial network just because of the way the types of features and lines and uh, kind of the way it draws the pictures. Actually, it, it does have preferences. It does have its own style. Interesting. Um, so even though you can tell these are album covers, and you can know in mind you can tell that they're fine art. There definitely is the, the the model itself definitely has a style. That's fascinating. And do you think that's dependent? So I, I think you said it, but it's dependent on the model that has its own style. Yeah, right. I think this particular model has its own style. And if you look at different models, um, like a very like a pure variational autoencoder, or like the like some of the recurrent attentive writers, um, some of the autoregressive stuff, they all have their own style too. Um, so, you know, there's, there's patterns you can kind of delineate in all of this stuff. It's, it's, you know, in some way the models effectively have their own personality yeah. and it's, it's recognizable. That's, and that's fascinating. Yeah. You mean you talk about yourself staring at all these images and being able to go, oh, yep, that's, that's, that's the model. That's a, feels like a skill set maybe that we'll see in the 2100. That's like, I can spot a model a mile away and I can tell you which one and, and how it got there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when this stuff reaches video generation, which is kind of the next step that I'm going to, and when it gets to the part where it can make convincing, uh, convincing video, then we're going to get into the scary part of this where <laughs> uh, you're going to find, you know, fake videos popping up and there are, are going to be experts who are going to be able to have to go and verify what's a real video, what's not. Um, yeah. That's going to be a phenomenon for sure. It's funny you say that because I've had family and friends, you know, show me a photo and, you know, I'm, I'm decent at Photoshop and, you know, in high school, that was something I spent a lot of time uh, just drawing around in and it's like, yeah, I can spot little artifacts that would suggest an image is Photoshop much better than the average person, which right. is the same skill set, really, which is fascinating. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you just you just sort of by doing it yourself and by staring at things for long enough, you just start to to recognize the features of of various products and one yeah. of those, you know, whether it's a Photoshop tool or whether it's uh, something else. But yeah, and that that will be an active area of expertise, I'm sure. Oh, that's that's interesting. I never, I haven't considered that. So, okay, so we talked about a bunch of different stuff. Um, you've talked about, you just mentioned thinking about the, the film applications. Do you think about any other additional applications of the work that you did um, that might be applied elsewhere? I mean, we touched on some of it, but yeah, I think um, in terms of just generating still frames, I think the I, I don't really know. Uh, you know, just still frames. I'm not sure what the market is beyond kind of interest and uh, creativity. You know, maybe you can blow these up to bigger sizes. But uh, the, the fact that this can be done, you know, and done for anything that can be represented as a matrix, can be represented in numbers, um, means that you could do this for all sorts of stuff. I mean, the things that immediately come to mind are game dev, um, where if you want to generate, a, you know, a new a 3D model, or you want to be able to generate levels automatically. And as a big game studio, you have tons and tons of data of your previous games. Well, something like this could, you know, legitimately just pop up a few characters. Um, it could, it could pop up a whole new level. Um, it could do this on the fly if you trained it right, and if you just processed your data in the right way. So I think the creative applications could be pretty widespread um, in terms of uh, generating content. And I think that's what it comes down to. And yeah. um, I think that could be extended to video probably as well in the future. Yeah, that's fascinating about the video game piece because I've always I've always had this feeling that um, so I, I used to play a lot of Call of Duty and I play Battlefield One now even, 
And one thing I've always noticed is that I really hate that feeling of a game starts and you've played this map a hundred times and you run to these different locations and you try, you immediately fall into these, these routines. And right. I've always felt like in theory, it should be generating an entirely random new map. Maybe it's based off of some theme. And then the more that we essentially upvote that map, then the more things should be there. And I, I think of that application right there, even with that work of saying, we should be playing random maps and the ones that work better and have the features that we like should just be generated more often. Yeah, right, exactly. And uh, I mean, a lot of the, gen I mean, there are lots of games that generate their own levels and their own, I mean, there, there's, this is, you know, generating, generation itself is not a new thing. True. Um, but to be able to do it without hand coding the, the actual feature set, be able to, right. hand, you know, that that's the, that's the beauty, real beauty here. And doesn't stop at visuals, you know, why not generate the music too? Uh, why not generate the story itself? Uh, you know, it's, it's, the sky is kind of the limit with this type of stuff because if you, if you just think of each of these models as gates or as modules you can put together, uh, you know, this, it becomes almost a Turing machine, right? You can just, yeah. you can do enough with it that you can stack them in the right way. You can probably do whatever the hell you want. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's awesome. Cool. So, um, if someone were listening right now, how could they be helpful at all? Is using or checking out your code? What? How? How can the audience be help, help you in any way? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, certainly. I think that you know the code that I have. I'm sure it could be improved. I think uh, just. I think just running with it. I mean, that's the biggest thing, right? Is uh, coming up with new stuff. Uh, uh, you know, figuring out what the real applications for this type of thing are. Um, I, that's what I feel like is is really needed. Is just more interest in general. I mean, there's a lot of interest, of course, but uh, if you think about what can be done with a lot of really passionate people in terms of just kind of extending these techniques, people who have more, you know, computational power, people who have access to more data. I mean, that's really the hardest thing about all this stuff is that you need a lot of data. You need a good data set. That's hard to come by at home, but there's lots of data out there. And, uh, you know, if, if there was more data available or people who had the lots of data could, uh, you know, kind of go crazy with this stuff. I think that's, uh, you know, the, the sky's really the limit and uh, a lot of really interesting things could happen. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and I've mentioned it in my other interviews too, of just, you know, you think of the the Facebooks and the Googles and how much data they're, they're acquiring and able to then do even more cool stuff and the kind of this accelerating returns for them. Um, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, and, and on that note, you know, and it's hard to know exactly what the state of the art AI and machine learning is because unlike other you know, unlike other uh, fields, a lot of it is behind closed doors because of the, you know, squeaky patent law and copyright and uh, just the fact that a lot of it's behind closed doors. There's a lot of black box to this stuff. The more regular people, the more hobbyists who can get involved and solve a lot of these problems, then the less that it's, you know, the more open source it is, the more general knowledge it is, the less it's kind of held in the hands of the powerful. And I think that's very important too, is that just regular people, because all this stuff is stuff you can do at home. Uh, yeah. You know, the more of us that can get involved and kind of uh, work on it together, then the more uh, the more distributed that knowledge is, and the, the less uh, the the less powerful it can be. Yeah, and then you know Elon Musk, they started OpenAI, and I think that's part of you know that's even further down the road of kind of being worried about making sure that everyone has access to this. Otherwise, it will be an elite oriented thing. Yeah, um, right. And you know. yeah, and it's, obviously that's uh, that's necessary too. But uh, just because it's so easy to access for regular people and for hobbyists, that's uh, it's it's something I think that people don't realize that almost anyone can really do if they, if they want yeah. to. You mentioned that you're kind of wanting to switch over professional and you're learning this stuff. So like, I mean, are, are you looking for a job? Are you finishing up school? Like, is, is there anything that could be helpful in that regard? Well, I mean, I do need a job. <laughs> 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 Anyone right. wants to give me a job is more than welcome. Yeah, uh, yeah no, so I, I am in school and I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm at this point just because I transferred uh, from a different university and went from anthropology and an English major to a computer science and math major. I'm much more far, I'm farther in my personal interests and personal hobby endeavors than I am actually in school. So I'm looking to get into the industry, I'm looking to get into the field. Anyone who can help me either with advice or opportunities or just, uh, you know, some tips, that, that would be, that would be amazing. And when do you graduate? I probably will graduate sometime summer of next year, or cool. I guess 2018, I should say. Cool. Great. Cool, and another thing I like to do is like a 30 second soapbox, 60 seconds, I don't really care anything you wanna to say to the world. Uh, I think I've said most of it already, but <laughs> um, I, I imagine that I will be somewhat of an outlier and that I'm not a PhD candidate and uh, I'm not a really prof I'm not yet a professional coder. All that I will say is that, um, you know, about a year ago I had the knowledge of high school algebra or high school pre-calc and uh, how to write some JavaScript and do some web development. 
And, you know, and now I'm moving on to stuff that's even more complicated than the generative adversarial network in this model. Um, you know, I'm a lot deeper than I even was three months ago. So all that I would say, what I would try and stress is that if you have an interest in artificial intelligence, machine learning, even if it's not that, but just something of similar uh, kind of uh, academic rigor, uh, you know, the amount of open source knowledge, the amount of open source libraries and modules, and the amount of just general uh, community and uh, guidance out there is so great that there's really no reason that no anyone can't get into this stuff. Anyone really can get into this stuff. Um, it's not it's not something you have to do only for an academic or if you're a professional. Um, this type of stuff can be a hobby now. And so all I would say is that if you want to do it, because uh, if you're just a little bit patient and willing to read a lot of code that doesn't make sense until it does, then you can really do anything. That's where I feel. You know, you're inspiring me. You know, and part of my journey in this podcast is is talking to people like you that that have, are a couple steps ahead of me, and it's empowering me to kind of learn more. And I know exactly that phrase you just said, where I've like I'm, you know, I have five courses online that I'm taking, and I've bought all these books, and I and I'm starting to run into the same concepts enough that I'm like, oh yeah, that's what they're going to talk about here. Here's a pro and yeah. there. Oh, I recognize that Python line. And it's, it's interesting, it's starting to slowly click, but it definitely feels like some days I'm way, way, way above uh, above my head. Uh, I mean, if, I think that if you don't feel that way, then you're doing something wrong. <laughs> There's this great quote I heard that if, uh, if you're in a jazz troupe and you're the best player there, you should find a new jazz troupe, right? So that's um, great. If, you're not in, if you don't feel like you're in over your head, then you're not taking in, in anything that's new. Uh, yeah. So I mean, there's nothing better than just a pat, you know, pile of books stacked up next to you, or ten open tabs with white papers, just wondering how the hell you're going to figure it all out. Yeah. Actually, one other question I'd love to ask is: is what is your setup? So, what did you run this training on, or what kind of hardware do you have? Sure. So this that particular model I ran with the 64 by 64 images I ran on my home computer, which is just an NVIDIA uh, 760, I think. So it's like two gigabytes of uh, GPU memory on an Intel i7 processor, Ubuntu. Um, I moved on to an AWS server for my for the the next step in that, and also to the stuff I'm working on now. But the images you see were generated on a pretty basic gaming computer. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, and you're using Lamba uh, for the AWS stuff, or no? No, I'm just using one of their uh, their uh, GPU servers. So it's Got a 12 it. gigabytes, just kind of the basic. Uh, uh, second tier C GPU server they just released, uh, but no, it's not Lambda, so I'm running Ubuntu on it and we're using it from the oh, command line and stuff like that. Cool. Um, cool. Well, I really appreciate you joining the show. Um, I'm going to put a link to your blog post as well as the, the GitHub um, code as well, just if people want to poke around. But I encourage people to check it out and take a look at the work also that inspired you, which you also linked yeah. in your blog post, um, which is super awesome as well. So I really appreciate you joining. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, thank you so much for having me. All right, take care.